Hi everybody, I'm, I'm talking from, from Bonn. Some of you might remember that conference over here, 2016. Uh, I think a lot of people have been to Bonn that time. Um, yeah, I, my name is Till Adams. Um, I was, I had the honor to chair the Global Phosphor G in, uh, in Bonn. Uh, I'm also quite active in uh, OSGU since a few years. Since last year, I'm member of the OSGU board, which is great fun, I must say. So, and beside all the time I, I spent in community building, community stuff, I also have some regular work and I work mainly as a consultant and agile coach for two companies. I founded the company of Terrestris in 2002 and in 2015 we founded a second company. It's called Mondialis and uh, that was me, my partner from Terrestris and also Marcus Nittela. Uh, I think quite a few of you might know Marcus. He's founding member of OSGEO and I think widely known as Mr. GrassGS. So um, that's more or less um, the background where I come from. Today I talk for uh, the company of, of Mondialis. And um, yeah, first of all, we started, when we started Mondialis, uh, we had something like an idea. Um, I think one of the reasons why we came to the idea or conclusion to found a second company and not to put that topic into terrestrials as well, was the uh, earth observation data and the release of the Sentinel data for free from the European community. And since then, um, I think a lot of organizations, even in Germany, which are quite conservative on that part, um, released uh, their data as open source. So there are tons of data on the one side, they're stored on cloud storages and whatever. Um, but you always have the problem if you want to work with this data, if you want to extract information out of this data, you have to download the data to your desktop. And that was our idea. Um, what if you could bring all these fantastic GrassGIS modules, processing chains and whatever to the tons of data which is lying around in the cloud. So that was one of the original ideas uh, we, we had that time. And um, yeah, we thought a little bit about that and said, okay, if it would be possible, if we could use GrassJS functions via an HTTP REST API call, um, and so bring the algorithms to the data, um, then we could do something that we originally called GRASS, which is um, the acronym for GRASS-GIS as a service. So that turned out later to the name Actinia, which is uh, part of the title of this talk. And um, the underlying idea was, of course, because uh, GrassJS is open source. So we have no license restriction in just deploying GrassJS anywhere in the cloud. Uh, we could um, even deploy 20, 30, 40 cores and didn't even have to care about or think about any license restrictions, which is, I think, really an advantage we have um, in the open source world that we just don't have to think about that. So these were the, the initial ideas we had. And um, yeah, before I go in a little bit deeper in that, um, normally if I would stay on stage now, I would please you to raise your arms, whether you already worked with GrassJS or not. But for everybody to, to follow that talk, I think it's quite important to have two slides about some GrassJS basics so that you get an idea how GrassJS in general uh, thinks. So if you installed GrassJS, there is something called the Grass database or GrassJS database, where all the data you're working on is put into uh, packed together and you can imagine it a little bit like a file browser. So you have below the GrassGIS database, you have locations which are kind of folders with the same EPSG code, the same area you're working on. Below the locations you have different map sets and in your map sets you have what we normally call layers. So you have vector tiles, raster tiles, earth observation images which are of course, mainly raster, raster tiles. Uh, you have spatial temporary uh, data, whatever you want to have. So that's the, the structure how, how GRASS is, um, uh, is handling um, its, its data. And when you work in GRASS.js, you work always on a map set. 
And the second thing which is important to know is that GRASS.js consists of hundreds of modules, GRASS modules. A GRASS module is anything that does anything. It could display something. If you look at the slide, you see something called u.clip, which um, as the name says, helps you to clip out a small extent of your vector data. And that's the u standing for. If you look at the at the bottom of the slide, there's a module called rslope.aspect, which helps you to calculate slopes and aspects based uh, on digital elevation models. There is an R before, so that applies to raster data and stuff like that. So that's the way how GRASS.js thinks. And what you do when you work with GRASS.js, you have a, either you have a command line tool and then you just call the commands and give some parameters into that input data, name the output data, give in some more parameters, whatever. And the second really cool thing you can do with GWAS.js, you can chain these modules. So you can, for instance, write a shell script or something like that. And in the shell script, you can chain different modules so that the output of the first module gets the input of the second module and so on and so on. Um, so that's kind of process chains you have in, uh, in GWAS.js. So just a number, I think, in the moment, there are around 400 GRASS modules, smaller ones, bigger ones, stuff like that. So this um, little bit background about GRASS.js. And, um, and then we had some thoughts about what we might have to do in order to port GRASS.js um, into, uh, into the web. And um, the first thing, of course, we must enable the user to list all the locations, the map sets, and the data as resources. Uh, of course, we would have to enable the usage of all the GRASS.js modules via an HTTP uh, call so that um, you directly could access a remote installed GRASS.js via a um, uh, uh, REST API. <clears throat> but we have to do something more. Um, if you think about the cloud, every calculation process in the cloud costs you money in the end because every CPU that is running, every storage you use uh, costs, costs money per time. Um, so we need something like a user administration that administers groups and roles and that enables you to restrict users to use only a certain amount of pixels or a number of processes, number of nodes, whatever. Um, the second thing we had to do is to think about the GRASS.js database management and especially we had to think about that we must lock map sets. If you have GRASS on your desktop, nobody cares because it's just your data you're working on. But if GRASS is on the cloud and everybody could access it, you have to lock at least the map sets in order to mind, um, mind uh, the conflicts that might, might appear on that part. And um, yeah, the last thing, which is really, really important because it lets you really use the power of, of cloud systems is to make GRASS.js scalable. Um, and this could be in, uh, in two, uh, made in two kinds. And the one thing is that you enable GRASS.js to split up huge processes, for instance, spatially, so that you have a lot of workers that all work on uh, smaller parts of your, of your job, especially usable if you work with a big earth observation data. And then at the end, put all the data back together into one file and give back the result to the, to the user. Um, or the other thing is just to say, okay, um, we want to have several nodes in a cloud environment, but somehow the, the nodes must uh, work together <clears throat> in, a in a certain way. I could explain that better with the with the next slide. So if you if you look at that slide, you see on the right-handed side you see some GRASS.js Actinia nodes which are deployed in the cloud, and on the left-handed side you have some somebody calling uh, process chains or GRASS modules or whatever. And if you think that um, user A sends a request to the grass and says, okay, I want, would like to run this module on this data. Then it gets back a number, an ID. 
And the Actinia nodes directly writes this process into the Redis database you see on the, uh, you can see on the right-handed side of the slide. So, uh, and then the process runs. And if you have big processes, it might take hours to finish them. So there is a mechanism you can always pull um, the Actinia node and ask, okay, what's up with my process? What's uh, up with my process? And then he reports back, yeah, it's still running, it's still running break up, it's finished, <clears throat> get your data here, whatever you want to have. But um, if you pull um, the whole installation, it might be that you won't hit the node, which actually is really processing your uh, process node. But every node is capable to look into the Redis database and get out the information and give that back to you. So that is how it works together, scalable on, 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 on several nodes. And uh, another very important part is if you want to deploy <clears throat> the software in a cloud environment, it's very clever nowadays to pack them into, into Docker files. And that is what we did so that you have a really easy deploy mechanism to uh, start up workers in the cloud, to shut them down, uh, delete them in order to save money on the cloud environment. So we packed that into, into Docker files. Uh, use Docker Swarm with Docker Compose to release them or other frameworks we listed up below like OpenShift or Kubernetes or Terraform. So that helps you really for a fast deployment uh, just out of your GitHub of the, the whole um, uh, thing <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in a cloud environment. Um, the next slide is a little bit more practical. So you directly could see what how you interact with an Actinia. Um, so you send a request like HTTPI um, my URL to Actinia slash locations and then uh, you get you receive back a JSON file which then lists up the locations. So you can see here it's a location one is NC SPM 08 and the second one is ECAD. That's the name of these locations. You always get back also the status of your request. That one was successful. And then you can go deeper into that. And then you add to your requests after locations, you add the name of the location and then you write, for instance, map sets. And then you get back a list, like on the right-handed side, uh, a JSON file, which uh, tells you about um, the, the map sets which are um, in that. Uh, um, in that um, location. Uh, a very cool thing, and that's what we really use in our daily work and our projects, are process chains. I told you before that <clears throat> uh, in GrassJS you're capable to chain several GrassJS modules, for instance by a shell script or something like that. Uh, what you also could do uh, on the Actinia side is to roll your own process chain. This is just writing um, uh, a JSON file like that one, which is a short one. We have some that have a few hundred lines of code. So you can chain different grass modules together into one uh, big process, which is especially handy if you really work on Earth observation data. So you can do, for instance, the first one is to um, to access uh, Sentinel-2 scene. The second one is to um, uh, do a classification on that. The third uh, process in your chain would be uh, calculate NDVI or something like that. And, and these uh, process chains are pushed through POST um, via the Actinia uh, API. And then Actinia will, uh, will um, talk to GrassJS and um, yeah, let your process chain run. So that's really, really interesting and, and good functionality you have here. So if you're more interested about this theoretically stuff, I'm not going over to, to that uh, website here. There is a website actinia.mundialis.de. Um, there is a AP documentation of everything you can do with Actinia, all the, the modules, crash modules, how you talk to them. Uh, some documentation, there are some examples. Um, so if I think it's much more better explained there than I could do here just in a few minutes. So keep that, keep that website in, uh, in mind. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. 
Um, yeah, sorry, um, Alistair, I need another 25 for that slide to explain that. But um, now it's just to give you an, a short overview about uh, what we did in the core. We have this Actinia GrassJS. We have several interfaces like the REST API I'm, I'm talking about. Um, there is also an OpenEO API. Uh, we always think about a WPS API. Um, we have some plugins that directly let you connect to several kinds of data like Sentinel data um, so that you don't have to import the data into your GRASP database. You just can mount it on the cloud system where it is. We, have, we are working on a connection to GeoServer. We have a connection to a metadata node in order to get out data and integrate it in processes. So a lot of things we, we did all around this Actinia and Actinia core in the, in the past year. The good thing is for you, Actinia is free and open source software. You find it on GitHub. Um, since March 2019, Actinia is also recognized as an OSGEO community project. So we are very proud about that. And um, yes, and I want to finish with some examples. I shortened it already. So I have only two of them and not three as mentioned uh, in the description of the call. Um, and the first one is a huge project uh, which is run by a big telecommunication company over here in Germany. You know, if you look at the fiber cable connections in Europe. If you look at the table, some countries like Estonia, they are near to championship and Germany is close to league two. So there's a lot of work to do uh, on that. And they are setting up a huge, mainly open source GS based planning tool. And one of the core functionalities about that is um, that we deliver a roughly planned, pre-planned um, fiber cable network for certain areas. And you must know that the cable installation costs depend really heavily on the surface type. Because if you dig into green land, it's, it's much more cheaper than you have to dig into roads or pavements or whatever. But especially this data is not available in, in Germany. So, what did we do? We put a lot of data together like aerial imagery, autophotos, LIDAR data, uh, implemented in Actinian process that let us automate to create um, training areas. Uh, and then we do uh, object-based supervised classification using machine learning, where we put all this data in, the training data in. And what comes out is something like that. This is a short piece of a village very close to, to Bonn here. And um, if it's this autophoto went through our process, you get something out like, like that one where you can clearly see, okay, we have buildings, we have Greenland, we have woodland, we have the roads. And that is for that process, the base um, to, um, to calculate the rough network. So this is all done via Actinia, which is integrated in a huge, huge, system on, on that. Um, the second example is more about to show which amounts of data uh, is possible to process with, uh, with Actinia. This is a work that mainly Marcus is working on for more than 10 years. Um, there's an US American satellite called MODIS, which has a sensor that uh, detects surface temperature, land surface temperature. And the problem is um, if there are clouds, like today here in Bonn, you, you don't get any data. And the task was to interpolate these holes and to deliver a scene with completely um, uh, data on it, like you can see on the, on the right-handed side. And um, this is really interesting if you look at this MODIS LST data, because they already cover 18 years. Um, so the, the satellite is crossing the earth for 18 years now and delivers four coverages per day, four, not five, four, uh, with a five, 250 meter resolution. So if you put all that together, you have about 26,280 data sets covering the whole world. I don't want to, I even can't in English name the number of pixels. I just wrote it below, but it's, it's quite a lot of data. And, um, and that's, if you look at that, if you would calculate the data on a, um, on a one CPU 400 megabyte RAM machine, and uh, you say, okay, it takes nine minutes per data set, um, then it would 
take you 164 days and six hours to calculate all this data and remember every day four new scenes come in. So you probably never get finished. But if you able to scale that up and do a parallelization of that um, calculation and processing in, for example, two um, uh, eight core engine, um, you can you can lower that down to uh, much less uh, much less time. Um, so, yeah, that's um, yeah just the end of the story. If you're interested in that data set, I put the link to a, to a metadata set describing the land surface temperature data uh, on the slides. I'm quite sure that we're going to share the slides after afterwards. And yeah, that's um, that's it. That's a short story about uh, Actinia, GrassGS. Uh, for now, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Till. That was really really interesting. Um, I've got. A host of questions here. Um, but first off, I think we'll start with two very similar questions. So from uh, Yusuf, who asks, what kind of machine learning algorithms uh, can we have using GRASS and Actinia? And also linked to that is from uh, David, who says, uh, are the machine learning algorithms you used for surface types available in an open format too? Um, I start with the second question. I would say yes. Look at the look at the GitHub page. If not, uh, drop me a question. And um, the first question that's really cool for me because that's the reason why I put on the slide that I'm more working as a consultant. Actually, I have no idea which which algorithm actually I used. I have to talk to the developers, but also you can send me just an email asking that, and I could deliver that uh, afterwards after the talk. Because I'm I'm not the person who really puts his fingers into that. I'm more the presenter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and then from Khaled, we've got: Do you do you think we can process large raster geospatial data on the fly instead of firing pipelines for backend processes that might take hours, especially for UAV data sets that can be tens of gigabytes for a single mm. file? I would say yes. I think it's it's more or less. Uh, um, the idea how you scale that, how you split up the process, so it's not real time, but near real time could be possible. But of course, depends on the data, depends on data format, depends on the amount of data and stuff like that. But I would give it a try because the engine is is ready for that. Uh, and um, again, if if you need some advice here, just come back to me and I will connect you to the appropriate person in the in the company. That's what I like, the type of uh, sort of gung-ho attitude, I'll give it a try and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> then report next for G. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, we've got one from James here, and it sort of links into something I was going to ask you as well. So James asks, are you involved in the OGC API processes standard development? And I was going to just ask how what you're developing with Actinia might sit in with, say, some of the WPS stuff that uh, exists right. already. Yes, so we are not involved in that. We are involved in the uh, OpenEO project, which is um, to make it, it's still it's already running for two years, I think, um, which uh, has the idea of uh, setting up a Unix standard um, for uh, processing APIs, stuff like that, but not in the OGC uh, stuff. And the uh, WPS, um, if you if you looked at the slides, maybe I go back to that. Um, it was uh, it was a red box. No, I was too fast. Sorry, that one. So um, we always thought about um, uh, implementing a WPS API on that. We have a actually we, we run a, pro, um, a project with uh, Mundialis and Terrestris where we connect the Actinia stuff to a, a web interface, which mainly is the stuff that Terrestris does. And there we had uh, huge discussions about whether implementing WPS API or just using the REST API. It ended up that we for now use the REST API. So we didn't really implement the WPS um, API yet. But I think maybe it's not worth doing that as all the OGC APIs in a, uh, a change in the moment. 
um, to new versions. So maybe it's better to to keep that on hold for for a couple of months and then look how it turns out with the new um, re WPS replacing API. Okay, cool. Um, let me just quickly go. So Andy is asking about the use of analysis ready data in these tools. Um, so I don't know whether that's whether or not yeah. they can be used or whether or not um, you can process up to, to analysis ready level. You could do both, of course. You can do your process chains and uh, bring your data in the shape you need it. Or uh, if you directly have the data, um, if you look at that slide already, I've I've mentioned that uh, as well. We we created uh, some some plugins, especially the Sentinel plugin, uh, which enables you directly to make use of cloud uh, stored um, Sentinel data without having to import it into the GRASS database, which would be an uh, additional step. Uh, and I could imagine of something like a plugin that directly connects to, to your data uh, into that. It's all written in, in, in Python, by the way. Okay, cool. Um, so I think uh, as we're coming towards the end of the session, I just, I've got one question and I don't know whether you'll be whether you'll know the answer to this one but it was <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning that grass has 400 modules i think you said um do you have any information about um the proportion of use for each of those different ones because i'm guessing some are used by all the grass users all the time yeah. are, there, are there other ones that you sort of think or oh, maybe we could just put put out to grass hey <laughs> I I think it's impossible to to figure that out because normally people use GrassJS uh, just on their desktop, so we have no yeah. idea. Maybe, maybe it's you, you get a clue about that if you go into the GitHub and see uh, which modules are updated and uh, with many developers stuff like that. I could ask Marcus. He's he's not actually he's not in the office, but uh, I think he he should know better a little bit. But. Okay. Even Marcus, I'm sure, does not know every of these hundreds of <laughs> modules in his brain. 